is a good motivator, and it's unfortunately a lot of what we have to talk about with community sense and response systems. There's a variety of applications for community sense and response, but uh, most of them are not particularly good. Up here in the upper left is the after effects from one of the earthquakes that uh, recently shook somewhere. We also have what, wildfires, epidemics, and water pollution. So these are all things that we think that we can monitor with enough deployment of sensors in the environment. And as we deploy more and more sensors in the environment, which is helped out a lot by the increasing changes in consumer electronics, then we can try to fuse some of this information to determine when these events are ongoing. Traditional sensors like this portal style radiation detector and this seismometer here in the bottom are extremely accurate and are very useful, but they have disadvantages in that they're very expensive, which makes them hard to deploy in areas that don't have money for infrastructure and also just makes it much less likely to have a dense network of expensive sensors. Instead, what you have is you have a sparse network and you end up trying to fuse data between the sparse sensors. So to solve some of that, we look at some of the cheap sensors that we have available, such as this $40 accelerometer that can perform some of the same functions as the seismometer, just not with the same degree of accuracy. So part of the question of our work is, to what extent can we fuse information from $40 accelerometers to try to approximate what a $10,000 seismometer would do? We also have CO2 sensors and a variety of other gas sensors that we use to try to detect air pollution as it moves through the communities. And if cheap Geiger counter that can be hooked up to a phone for detecting radiation, such as threats from dirty bombs and other events. Uh, Twitter, believe it or not, can be used to detect certain types of things as they move through. The end question that we were trying to answer with a lot of our work during the thesis was, you know, can we detect geospatial events with noisy inputs? Smartphones are really helpful in deploying all these sensors around the world, and one of the things that's useful about them is that they're extremely prevalent in areas that don't have money for infrastructure such as $10,000 seismometers. Instead, you can find side, um, networks of smartphones in places that wouldn't have traditional infrastructure, and that's where we hope to be able to really release earthquake warning using phones, is places where we wouldn't be able to deploy the more expensive sensors. Uh, another example of ways that we can interact with the environment uh, visually. And so we have estimated roughly 200 smart devices per kilometer squared in the LA area. It's obviously not quite as dense in some of the other areas of the world, but you know, it gives you an idea of what kind of a sensor network we can tap into if we can find ways to use the information generated by those sensors. And as an example of what's possible, we have information from a seismic uh, from an accelerometer deployment in Signal Hill. What they were doing is they were trying to determine the subsurface structure in LA so that they could get money out of mining for oil. And they deployed an extremely dense network from Signal Hill <coughs> for that purpose. So there's 5,000 seismometers blanketing that area, which is about 160 sensors per kilometer square, which is about as good as you're gonna get. So we have a video here that shows a earthquake moving through the Signal Hill network and they were able to share this data with us after the earthquake happened. But it gives us an idea of what it would look like if we had this available to us in real time. And it's pretty easy to see the wave front traveling across the sensors. But what's really interesting here is if you watch, you can see how the waves actually change as they hit different objects you can't see. So you get this scattering pattern after the initial waves, of, and then it just diffuses through the whole network. In fact, if we plot the amplitudes across the Signal Hill network, If you plot the peak amplitude across the Signal Hill network, this black line that you see dividing the two areas is actually one of the fault lines in Southern California. So you can see that the way that the waves diffract across the Signal Hill network is actually impacted by subsurface structure that's not otherwise apparent. So we actually have a pretty good <coughs> seismic infrastructure in Southern California with expensive seismometers, but this is not information that you can extract from those seismometers because their density is just not anywhere near adequate. So one of the things that we hope to be able to generate from these dense networks of seismometers is rapid detailed shape maps at a level that's just not possible with sparse networks. Subsurface maps that show where the shaking is different based on subsurface structures. Possible imaging of fault ruptures based on how the waves propagate. Building and structure monitoring by deploying sensors throughout buildings. 
and earthquake early warning by delivering warning to people that are not near the epicenter. Uh, for CSN sensors, we are detecting and measuring quakes with sensors that we deploy in the Southern California area. We have both the 16-bit USB accelerometer you can see on the left, which we have several hundred of deployed around Southern California, and also through people who voluntarily downloaded and installed the CSN Droid app, which submits sensor readings in real time to our network in addition to the USB accelerometers. We have data going back quite a ways. This is from a 3.5 earthquake back in 2011, which is something that most people wouldn't notice. And in Pasadena, which isn't uh, all that close, we were able to record an event with these USB accelerometers that most people wouldn't be able to feel. And that shows that even though these sensors are not the type of high quality instruments that seismologists are used to, they're still capable of <coughs> extrapolating the information we need to achieve our goals with shape maps and earthquake early warning. We also tested these different types of sensors on a shake table to determine whether or not we could record the, um, the shaking that was necessary in order to get the earthquake information. So for the EPA sensor, which is our reference sensor, uh, you can see the what was generated by the shake table there. Um, and then for a phone on a table and a phone in a backpack, you can see that the while the waveforms that are generated from the shake table are not nearly as clear, they're still quite discernible and we're able to determine whether or not there's an ongoing event. So all six of the events we tested, which is playing back known earthquake events through the shake table, were triggered from both the phones and the USB accelerometers. Uh, so one of the things we did is we took these devices and we spread them all throughout the library at Caltech. And then we shook the library from the top using a big shake machine that kind of looks like an oversized washing machine. You stick some weights in it and spin it around. And, uh, you get a pretty good amplitude going up and down the library. And the recording across floors for the USB accelerometers and for the phones is shown on the left and on the right. Obviously, the recording for the USB accelerometers is quite a bit better, but the phones, even though they're not fixed and they're sort of jerking around a bit wherever we put them in the library, uh, you can still see how the wave sort of moves along the library and you can get the right frequency spectrums out. So low-cost sensors can detect changes in resonant frequencies of high-rise buildings. That's the main conclusion we got from that. And so we want to see what we can do with using even simple phone sensors, but also USB sensors to detect structural changes by deploying these sensors for, let's say, office workers in a high-rise building who wouldn't otherwise have insight into the changes that happen in their building as a result of seismic events. Um, and then Annie will talk about decentralized detection. So one key point of using this kind of noisy sensor for detection is how we aggregate the data to determine whether there's event happening or not. So the naive way of doing this is using hypothesis testing. Um, so we can just streamline um, all the raw data, raw exploration data from our sensor into a centralized <coughs> server and do a hypothesis testing, saying what's the probability of observing this acceleration given that there's an event, um, and what's the probability of observing this acceleration given that there's no event, and compute a ratio and compare that to a threshold. And it's greater than a threshold, we decide that okay, there's an event and if it's smaller, then uh, we say there's no event. So the problem with doing that is that we have, um, when we have a lot of sensors, uh, and then we're looking at, uh, so for the fidget, I think they're like 250 hertz, um, and for the phone, I think it's slightly lower sampling rate. That means that if we have 10,000 sensors, we'll produce more than 300 gigabyte of acceleration data, and that's like the amount of traffic that we just can't handle. Um, so centralized solution doesn't just doesn't scale, and we need to come up with a decentralized way of dealing with the event detection problem. So how we're doing this is that we do a simple processing at the sensor level. Um, we first compute the probability whether that uh, event has occurred or not, and if and we think that event has occurred, we say that there's a pick, and we send this binary information. Um, pick and no pick to the centralized server. And in the centralized server, we are also doing hypothesis testing. So rather than doing that on the raw data, we're doing on this pre-processed binary signals. 
And that can cut down our uh, traffic by a factor of 1,000 or even more. So how are we doing this kind of uh, pre-processing uh, event detection at the sensor level? So we actually have two different kind of algorithms for the USB sensors, what we call the fidget, the 16-bit, um, the better quality sensor. We're using this very simple um, detection algorithm called uh, STA over LTA. It stands for short-term average over long-term average. So what we do is that we take a smaller window and we compare that to the average of a longer term window in the past. And then we save a gap in the between, so just uh, we can observe that the uh, the transient effect when the event is just happening when it's ramping up. So that works fairly well. And this is just the data that we got from uh, the fidget and then the red curve is like the event that's happening. <coughs> so on the phone it's a lot of, it's a lot harder because when we're carrying the phone, we're sitting, we're walking, we're jogging, or maybe bumping the table when the phone's resting on the table. So the noise level is a lot, much larger than this fidgets. And then we need to come out with something more um, reliable for detection. So here we come across this, this problem that we want to train the sensor to identify the event. But the problem is that we don't have enough positive example. We just, we haven't observed enough earthquake. That's actually a major problem with this project that it's hard to observe earthquake. Like we actually come to the meeting every week and then seismologists say, oh, there's no earthquake. <laughs> I'm so disappointed. Um, so like when there's something happening, we're all really excited. So how do we get over this kind of problem? So the solution is anomaly detection. So although we don't have enough positive example, we actually do have a lot of negative example. So we can actually estimate the probability of observ observing a sudden acceleration given that there's no event. Um, and the way we do this is to learn a Gaussian mixture model of the, um, the sensor uh, spectrum produced on the phone. So you can think of that, um, that there's, so look at this, this example here. You can imagine that each peak in the Gaussian mixture, it could be like, uh, here I might be walking, here I might be running, here I might be you know, sitting around. And then there's a certain threshold around here that we want to learn that if we observe signal that's different, that's greater than a certain threshold, then we want to say that there's a detection. And this is the, the threshold is something that we can, turn, we can learn through time. So we use this algorithm and do a simulation on a uh, magnitude 5.5 earthquake <coughs> and see what kind of detection performance that we can get. So here on the uh, y, y axis, you have the true pick rate, the true positive, and then on the x axis, you have the false pick rate, the false positive. And so this is like a very typical traditional curve that we use for um, binary classification and also for detection. It's called the Barat curve, so the server operating characteristic curve. So you want to be at the top left corner. That means you have very high true positive rate, but very low false positive rate. So you can see that just by doing STA and RTA, the fidget is doing pretty well. It's like almost, almost there. So let's look at the data from the fidget, uh, from the phone. So if we're applying the same algorithm on the phone, and it's doing really doing no better than just random guessing because there's too much noise in there. So now if we're we're using our Gaussian mixture model and our detection algorithm, we get much better results. So I really lift the curve up to here, and it's still not as good as the fidget, but then there's it's it's not random guessing anymore. So by learning this Gaussian niche model, we have another problem, which is that um, we take, it takes a lot of sample to learn a correct model, a correct Gaussian mixture model. And if we want to retrain this model, say, every day, um, then it's a lot of data that we need to store on the phone. And, but like, 
we really don't have that much capacity on the phone to store that much amount of data. So how do we get around doing it? So an idea that was, cir that was circulating around was this idea of corset that we borrow from statistical learning. So the idea of corset is that you can just keep a few very significant separating um, features in your uh, samples in your data, and you can use those features, those sample, to construct the Gaussian mixture model that's almost exactly the same as using all the data. So, and there are some theorems, there are some proofs saying that this is theoretically, there's theoretical guarantee uh, to reproduce the same Gaussian model. So we adapt the idea and run some experiment. So here on the, uh, here the graph is showing the training results. And on the x-axis, we're seeing the training data size goes <coughs> from um, 10 to like 10 to the five, 10 to the fifth. And then on the y-axis, you're seeing how closely that learned model is to the actual model. And if using a full set, you're getting you know, really good data, but then that's on the scale of like 10,000. And we're just doing uniform sampling using in, in this uh, of the sample. And then we get this curve, which is not very good. We need like at least a thousand um, labels to get that, uh, samples to get that. But if you use core sets, then we can get to the same results by using like much fewer samples, which means that it can be computed in memory, can be stored in computing memory. And then going back to the uh, area on our curve, uh, this is showing like very similar uh, result, but this is actually on detection of an event. So on the y-axis is the um, how well it does for detection, and then you observe the same pattern that you can use, you can achieve the same performance as the full set by using much fewer samples. So that's one of the results that we got. So we also did uh, this using uh, a simulation using a historical earthquake that was Baja M7.2 earthquake. And we just overlay the foam noise on top of that uh, signal. And then what you can see is that by, by doing purely hypothesis testing, you get this pale uh, green curve. But then if you're, we're doing a non detection using Gaussian mixture, then we get a much better result. So a lot of the sense and response applications that we've talked about have some distinct needs for architecture, but earthquake is slightly unique in that the load induced on a system that wants to handle earthquake early warning is erratic beyond and almost anything else that you can sort of think of. It's uh, worse than getting slash dotted. Um, so this is just a snapshot of organic changes in serving for the USGS website back in 2003 after the Compton or, uh, no, I'm sorry, after the San Simeon earthquake hit. And so you can see that it's not a very popular website. It doesn't tend to get a lot of traffic. But, you know, shortly after the earthquake hits, the, the traffic, you know, this is several orders of magnitude beyond what the servers would normally see. So the problem with serving traffic for doing quake detection is that you really want to be able to handle this level of traffic as organically as possible, but you want to be provisioned for this level of traffic because 99.999% of the time, that's the amount of traffic you're expecting to see. So this is one of the reasons why we ended up opting to implement the CSN infrastructure on top of Google's App Engine product. It was one of the few products out there and remains one of the few products out there that can scale the number of instances in seconds as opposed to minutes or some other greater period of time. Uh, it also bought us a lot of things as researchers not having to worry about replication of data. So if you know, the earthquake takes out Southern California, we won't lose our precious thesis data. And we don't have to worry about maintaining the servers or wearing a pager to make sure it's actually up and ready 24 hours a day because we don't know when the earthquakes are going to hit. It has a few drawbacks in that you know, it's a fully distributed architecture with very limited synchronization primitives. And there's execution time limits in terms of how long you can run algorithms on top of the system and restrictions on what type of information you can query for. So some of that led to some of the algorithmic choices that we made in how we performed earthquake detection. In particular, for spatial events, at the time that we did this, App Engine didn't have any way that you could perform geospatial queries. What you could do were inequality queries on one property, uh, such as latitude, longitude, or time. 
Um, but what you do then to get around that is you use spatial hashing so that you can do equality tests to figure out where events are happening in space. And then time slices let you figure out whether or not these events are actually correlated in time. So we use something that we call geocells, uh, which is a binary representation, which is just encoding east, west, and north, south components in a binary string. So we just said this is west of uh, the prime meridian, and so it's a zero, and this is north of the equator, it's a one. East gets another one, south gets a zero, and so on and so forth, until you come up with a really long string. And so using this, we can encode arbitrarily sized regions that we can use to associate different types of incoming fixed strings with each other to determine whether or not they're spatially coordinated. Uh, this is an example of how this works out in practice. So this is some of the geocells in the Southern California area at different sizes. So we use different sizes depending on what types of events we're trying to track. So smaller events for smaller geocells, and larger events for coordinating and determining region-level information, we use the larger geocells. Um, another thing that complicates some of the stuff is that even our base load, which you know, we only have as much of as we choose to generate, is still uh, incredibly diurnal. So this shows sort of the general traffic as we move through the days. And to sort of make that illustration even more stark, we actually have two graphs here. Uh, the top and bottom show a home and an office sensor based on the frequency of picks depending on the time of day. Uh, and if you had to guess, I think you could probably figure out which one's the home sensor and which one's the office sensor. So, you know, between the hours of roughly 8 and 5, the office sensor lights up like a Christmas tree Monday through Friday, and then the opposite is pretty much true for the home sensor. So we need to be able to account for this in our algorithms in terms of, you know, how we estimate whether or not the probability of a pick is likely to be associated <laughs> with an event, but also in terms of our provisioning for the load for the servers. Uh, the, the architecture we implemented did handle pretty well. Sort of the most interesting event we had while we were analyzing the data for this was the CLOS stock event. And this ended up being interesting because we had recently incorporated the CISN sensors into our network uh, just to be able to test the architecture because there's a lot of them and they're very precise sensors. So the CISN is part of the normal uh, seismometers that operate in Southern California, of which there's several hundred. And so the CLOS stock event was a large earthquake in Japan which uh, picked very well on the CISN sensors. So here you can see the, the QPS level for the pick rate, which is the dark blue line. I apologize, it's kind of a busy graph, but the pick rate goes from about two maybe QPS and then hits about 90 within the span of 10 seconds. Uh, so that's sort of the kind of growth rate that we expect during an actual event. Um, and then the instances, which is the number of instances that we provisioned on App Engine, does basically the same thing. So we had a base load of roughly 12 instances, and by the time the peak of the event had happened, we had then generated another 80 instances on top of that to handle the load. Now, it wasn't perfect. So the dark red and the black line show the pending pick rate and response times which mean that we weren't able to process in real time all of the incoming picks as they arrived. Uh, some of them had to wait several seconds before they could be processed, which is not ideal for actually doing earthquake early warning. But you know, we were investigating ways to drive the pending pick time down even lower. Because you, you can see uh, from the next graph that after this event had happened, the system stabilized. So this is a larger view of the same data, but the next time, the aftershock, the instance count again went up by about uh, 30 this time, uh, but the pending pick rate and the pending pick time didn't change at all. And that's because at this point, <coughs> the system had kind of adjusted to the expected load levels and the variation in those load levels. And so we want to know how we can sort of prime the system for being capable of adjusting to these loads as quickly as possible and not have to worry about uh, losing picks by seconds, because that really impacts our detection time. Um, you know, that's more about the eight of us. So, uh, before I was talking about how we do the sensor level detection on the, on the sensor itself, but now, like, when we actually need to aggregate those data together, and how do we do it? So, just to illustrate how difficult this problem is, um, here's a graph that illustrates this problem. Um, so, as you can see, the, these are three 
fidget sensors. They are located at the same location, but um, different, uh, attached to different computing devices. One's on netbook, the other's on PC, and the other's on some sort of computer. And even though they're at exactly the same location, they actually produce a pretty different peak profile um, in terms of acceleration, which just means that the data we're getting is really noisy, uh, regardless whether we're doing the sensor level pre-processing or not. I mean, doing the pre-processing, of course, helps, but then the, the result is still pretty noisy. And another, another graph to illustrate this problem is this. Um, this is plotting all the, the fraction of um, peak uh, responses doing different events uh, according to acceleration. So you can see that each line is doing a different event. And the, the interesting thing is that the blue line is actually measured when the sensor, are in, when uh, everything's supposed to be in a quiescent period and there's nothing happening. And that looks almost exactly the same as some other smaller event. And the black line is the Yorba Linda, which is one of the larger events that we observed uh, during the deployment. And that one looks significantly different, but that was also one of the largest one that we got. So, but the other one, there's no way of telling by acceleration and by picking fractions of um, whether an event has occurred or not. And this is also illustrating how the same type of sensor at the same location attaching to different devices can generate pretty different profile. The, yet the, the red one are from one sensor and the black one is from another sensor. And they are exactly the same type of sensor. And you can see that they generate pretty different profile at the same time. So that the, sens the sensor noise is one of the problems that we're dealing with. <laughs> another thing is that the signal that we're trying to detect is really weak. We want to detect really small events <coughs> that sometimes cannot be picked up by human. Most of the time cannot be picked up by human. So, but the problem with detecting a weak event is that it's usually, the signal is varying in noise. So say that we have an event um, in the middle, which is the star, and then we have a bunch of sensors around it. The green means that there's no, no pick, <coughs> the red means that there's no pick. So this is just like a cute cartoonish illustration of what's happening. So you can see that as the, the event propagates in this area, you're getting more picks, but not all the sensors are picking. And we can actually give it a more formal definition of a weak signal. That is that if we say uh, each sensor generates a binary random variable, and then we can take the zero norm of this combined array of all the data we observe, and if it's, if it's smaller than the square root of n, then we say that's pretty small signal. And the, the zero norm just really means that how many picks are there at a, certain, at, at a given time. So a simple idea of how to get around doing it is <coughs> to somehow aggregate the data together. So here's also like another illustration of how this can help. So say suppose the, you observe the distribution of pick um, probability on a single sensor, and the record being the, um, the hypothesis, and then the, uh, the blue curve being the no hypothesis, and there's very little separation between the two on a single sensor. And if you aggregate everything in the network together, that separation is not increasing. But if you can somehow aggregate a sensor near to uh, Orion's nearby neighbor, then you can actually get some separation. And if you do it more cleverly, like you have some sort of way, you know how to aggregate the, 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 the sensor together, you can get even better separation. And the amount of separation determines how well we can detect an event. So <coughs> we did a little experiment trying to see how we can do this better. So here we take a really simple simulation and we grade the world uh, into different cells and then we're doing um, um, a very selected different type of uh, aggregation. And so this curve, this, this result is showing that if we're doing that eagerly, that we're aggregating everything together, that our result's not very good. But if we do it uh, with some selection, we can get better results. And the same thing with 
Fissure, the same thing with androids. And, but now the question is, <coughs> this kind of aggregation is because we have, we get at this kind of aggregation because I have some prior knowledge of how the event can be propagated. But a lot of time we don't really have that information and the question is whether we can learn this from the data. And the answer is yes. So um, there's some math here, I'll, I'll try to just highlight the important idea and not get into the math. So say we have a weak signal and suppose each sensor is observing a binary random variable and it's the, the signal is being corrupted by some error rate, epsilon. That means that at any given time, uh, there's a equal probability of flipping the bit. So a hypothesis testing that we illustrated in the beginning of the talk is that we can uh, do the, we can compute a ratio of probably given that um, the event has happened, probably given that it's no event, and if you greater than a threshold, then we say there's an event. And then with 10 sensor, you can get a separation like this, 50, you get a separation like this, and 100, and 500. So what we're observing here is that if this sensor model that we're assuming is what's really happening, that we're, the fact that we're increasing the number of sensor, that just means that the, the, the uh, event is harder and harder to separate, that we cannot distinguish whether something has happened or not. So what this is saying is also that if we want to detect a very weak event, we are we need our noise to be diminishingly uh, decreasing, and that's just not possible because, like, if we have uh, ten sensor, we have this kind of noise profile. If we have hundred sensor, we're still gonna get the same kind of noise profile. So we um, formalize this problem better and um, and define that there's a sparsifiable event. That is, the idea is that if we can change, um, if, if there's a way that we can encode a signal into a smaller number of bases, then we can actually detect this better. So if you think about analogy will be Fourier transform. It's taking this really complex signal and break it down into a linear combination of much simpler um, patterns. So we're trying to do the same thing um, but we do that by finally learning this also normal basis B. And so we say that um, after this transformation happened, we the signal is concentrated on uh, a few a few bases uh, rather than spreading out across all the bases. And there are some theorem proofs saying that if we can do this, then the um, we can reliably detect any event uh, given that our noise rates is less than half, which is a very reasonable assumption. And so that leads naturally to a learning algorithm. So if you look at, observe this, this um, probability, sorry. and then you can see that we're taking the, the <coughs> zero norm before the transformation and compare that to the zero norm after transformation. And so the smaller this, this, uh, this number is, the smaller is our error of eight bounded. So the learning algorithm <coughs> is just to minimize this zero norm um, and subject to some orthogonality constraint just to make it easier. And this problem naturally transformed into two existing techniques. Uh, one is independent component analysis. Uh, the other is um, sparse latent semantic analysis. So these are all techniques that people use in uh, this kind of learning problem. <coughs> and so we can observe what kind of basis we're actually learning. So the basis is actually encodes how the data should be aggregated together. So we, uh, you, we uh, do the learning on a whole bunch of data on <coughs> the uh, aftershock detected after the March 11th big earthquake in Japan in 2011. And so here are some of the bases that we detect, uh, we learned. So there's a basis that's like this shape, one's like this shape, and one is like this ring, and one's this spot. Uh, this actually makes a lot of sense because the Tohoku earthquake happened somewhere around here. 
And then so a lot of aftershock that we are observing in this data set is actually the pattern of how the wave are propagating. So this is like a very natural way of learning how to combine your data. So we also employ, uh, we also test this algorithms on some real events recorded by the CSN uh, sensor networks. So here are four events. Um, so here the red dots are the CSN sensors. <laughs> And then here's one of the events in Beverly Hill, one Yorolinda, and one is Brawley. <coughs> so here's a video that shows um, uh, one of the events. And you can see how the wave is propagating and how the CSN sensor are detecting this event in terms of the feed rates. So now the event just started around here. It's like propagating. And remember that all our sensors are around this area. Thing like the P wave just went through. <coughs> you can see a whole bunch of here light up <coughs> in a sequence. And then in a bit, the S wave will come through. Yeah, let it run now. So it just shows how the CSN sensor are detecting this relatively larger earthquake, but still on a, uh, a small, small size one. So we applied this, the same techniques on this four different earthquakes and plotting the amount of time that it takes to detect this event. And so the two blue ones are the learned uh, machine learned uh, detection algorithm and they uniformly either uh, outperforms the, uh, the baselines and, or does about the same as the baseline, but never uh, worse than that. And on the best case, you can actually detect like up to 10 seconds faster than some of the uh, baseline that we used. So here's Michael's gonna show you some pretty graphs of the data that we collected. Yeah, so this is actually more, more just for fun, but it shows some of the data that we were able to collect from the networks. Uh, for most of the subsequent graphs, what we're showing here is time moving along the x-axis and then distance from the epicenter of the earthquake on the y-axis. Neither of these are zero, just because if they were zero, it would be extremely hard to see, because you can see this earthquake is extremely far from Pasadena. This is about 350 kilometers from the core of our network. But what we want to show here is that the blue wave, I'm sorry, the blue line and the red line in these graphs represent the P and the S wave as estimated based on the known epicenter and its distance from our network. So you can see that this quake is too far and too small. Well, I mean, 6.3 is not small, but it's a long way away to really pick up the P wave. I mean, there's a few sensors that look like they might have tripped, but they might have also gotten kicked. Uh, the S wave, on the other hand, you know, lights up. And so one of the things that we're trying to figure out with this algorithm is just how can we um, easily identify these lines, right? Because these lines not only help us detect that the earthquake has happened, but lead us back to uh, the point in space time where it occurred. So that was a, a long way away. This one's much closer to home, but it's only a 2.8. So even though this is only a 2.8, you can see that now that we're close enough that we're starting to pick up a little bit of the P wave, right? The, the S wave stands out. Um, really well. Uh, the estimates are always a little shifty, especially close to the earthquake, but this gives us a better idea of exactly what we're tracking to. And all of these are the, the picks from the networks in Pasadena with USB accelerometers. Once we start adding in uh, sensors from CISN and farther afield, then we get a much more accurate picture of what's going on. So this is the Santa Barbara Channel event, and we're, again, pretty far. We're about 150 kilometers from Santa Barbara Channel. But if we add in the CISN network sensors, the P wave shows up a lot better. Um, and I sort of trust their uh, version of events, so the estimate should probably be shifted a little bit to the left. But you can see now exactly how well the P and the S wave stand out for the earthquake. And for the CISN sensors, there's not really any, um, this is using our own picking algorithm, not the CISN picking algorithm, but on top of the CISN side um, uh, wave data. And so now everything stands out really well, and the potential for false picks is practically zero. So this is pretty much how we did a lot of the hypocenter detection stuff that we worked on briefly. 
which is we're trying to fit these narrow bands of time that make the data make sense. And uh, this is a version of the cone detection algorithm that we go into in one of our papers, which is just how do we estimate the hypocenter based on the, all this noisy pick data, right? We're, we, so we bin the pick data in try to figure out how it's correlated in space time and use that to back out where we think the hypocenter of the earthquake should be. This is for a 3.9 earthquake in Newhall, which was close enough and large enough that we got pretty good data on both the P and the S wave. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're also trying to do some structural monitoring. So here you can see this is a 50-story building in downtown LA that we've instrumented with two sensors per floor from the bottom to the top. On the left graph, you can see an earthquake, a small 4.1 earthquake that as it moves through the building, and this is how the data is correlated between the sensors. And on the right, uh, you can actually see the shear wave traveling up and down the building. Uh, that's uh, aggregated from uh, quite a bit of data to back out how the shear wave moves through the building. But you know, we are really hopeful that we can use that type of monitoring in buildings and other buildings as soon as we get access to them to determine when these types of waves change in structure in the building, which would imply that the structure of the building itself has changed. Uh, so, you know, so in conclusion, uh, we really hope that we can perform a lot of this community sensing with dense, inexpensive sensors to accomplish things that sparse, even expensive sensors can't accomplish. Uh, and now we can deploy these in places where they wouldn't be available to have expensive sensors. We are decentralizing both at the sensor level and at the architecture level, and we're using machine learning to help us out with scaling by not only interpreting noisy data into something that we can actually make sense of, but also to buy us a lot of room to grow in terms of reducing the signal that we have to deal with at the server level. Um, so the Caltech CSN team is composed of uh, everybody up here on the board, a lot of people from computer science, earthquake engineering, the Seismo Lab, and the Center for Advanced Computing Research. And they are all still actively working, even if Annie and I are not. And we can put you in touch with anyone that you'd like to uh, work with. Uh, they're currently working on deploying more sensors around the LA area. So the green dots here show sort of our old footprint for CSN. All of the other dots show the school districts that we're currently trying to enter. So we're entering the LA USD school district, which is all the red dots. We hope to cover every LAUSD school district at some point, which would get us a really big chunk of Southern California. And then the other dots show different other school districts that we haven't gotten permission to enter yet, but that we're hopeful that we'll get permission to enter. And if we can cover this whole area, then we'll be doing really well to getting the dense network that we need in Southern California. We're also exploring these are ocean bottom seismographs that we're using to determine what we can do in terms of warning for offshore earthquakes, since obviously deploying phones in the ocean doesn't work as well. So we need some other kind of mechanism to determine when things are happening off the coast that we can't handle with our dense networks that are on. This is just a quick interest picture in terms of what a lot of the sensor deployments that are not phones look like in Southern California. You can see we have a little single board computer there that's hooked up with a battery. Uh, the, this is the CPU that drives things. This is the actual accelerometer device. And we use this to make sure that we can run even during small power outages so that we can keep transmitting data back to the server as long as the internet connection stays up. Um, and with that, if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, about six months ago, we had somebody from the Berkeley lab talk about them similar. Uh, do you guys work with them? And the other thing is that uh, she talked a, a lot about using cell phones as sensors. Uh, was that your stuff, or do they are they working on that in parallel? Uh, I don't know if they're working on the cell phone stuff in parallel, but I know there's somebody from Berkeley here, and if they want to say they. Sure. Yeah, I'm from Berkeley Technological Lab, so we are working actually in parallel. So we are also working on using smartphones to detect earthquakes by slightly different uh, like algorithms. So yeah, it's a. I don't think there's a collaboration right now between Berkeley and Caltech, so it's separate. It's a separate project. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I believe we looked at combining sensor data at one point, but the problem is that we have sort of completely different infrastructures, and so sharing sensor data turned out to be a non-trivial task. And yeah. they're mostly operating in Northern California, and we're most in Southern California. But yes, I do have several questions. So. When you do the like a Gaussian mixture model, what the features are you fitting into the, the model? And also, like uh, when you do the, the sample, <coughs> sampling your like uh, the 
uh, non-earthquake data. So is that is that similar to like uh, maybe like K-means cluster? Like you cluster several like main clusters, and then you disassemble using the like the centroids or like I, I I didn't quite understand you like the method you described. Okay, so I'll answer the first question sure. first. Uh, second question I didn't quite understand, but uh, we'll, we'll get into that later. So the first question is like, what features am, are we using to learn Gaussian neutral model? So we're using a whole bunch of things like the maxima acceleration. Uh, we're doing fast Fourier transform of the uh, raw acceleration data and use that uh, as a feature. We're also processing that with uh, PCA, principal compound analysis, to reduce the dimensionality uh, before we fit the Gaussian model. So there's like a whole list of things that we, we try to learn the, the model. But all these are like uh, calculated on the phones, right? So what's the impact on the, like the, what's the impact on the battery on, on the phones? Yeah, so um, we have at different points do the battery analysis. Just keep in mind this was like done like four years ago. And so like the battery lives improved quite a lot. So we did have the experiment of turning the uh, the Droid the, the Droid app on for the whole day. It does drain your battery quite a bit. Um, but like I say, like our has mm -hmm. gotten better and then the battery technology has gotten better. So the the yeah, the, the same data it will be different now. And I can answer your second question maybe offline. Sure. Is there a fundamental advantage of using the cell phones? It looks very impressive that, oh, a smartphone's community. <laughs> but do we really need smartphones? Can we just put some sensors in every building? Yeah. So we can put sensors in every building in places where people let us, for one thing. Um, that's not really <coughs> possible. The smartphone deployments, one of the things that we're really interested in is places where there aren't fixed deployments. So we explored different deployments both in India and in Peru where internet access for fixed deployments is actually harder than you might think it is, but mm. smartphones are very prevalent. And so we've looked at all sorts of ways of transmitting data from smartphones and pseudo smartphones in these types of environments where we can't have fixed deployments. You know, there's not necessarily power infrastructure, there's not necessarily you know, an internet cafe, but there is like edge and 3G and, and these kinds of things. So we've even looked at like how can we piggyback pick data on top of SMS text messages, right? So as long as we can get the data out and the smartphone is providing the power and the network connection, right, we can now enter places where we wouldn't be able to enter even with fixed sensors because we just don't have the infrastructure for it. So there are places where this is the only option. In terms of when the system is fully working, working in, let's say, in the perfect world, how many seconds are we going, are we talking about that you will get advanced on? Yeah, I mean, it's a, a great and popular question. The problem is it's a completely dependent on your distance from the epicenter. Sure. Um, you know, so the best that we can do is extremely large if you're really far from the epicenter, in which case you probably don't care very much. And if you're on the epicenter, with this particular network, you know, we couldn't warn you at all. Um, but you know, so the, one of the cases that we're interested in is that the large fault you know, off the east side of LA ruptures, right? That's sufficiently far from LA that we can provide people in LA with almost a full minute of warning, um, which you know still isn't great in terms of human terms, but you know it's actionable. And one of the other things that we're looking at is you know even if we can only provide seconds, we can do certain types of automated response that are useful. You know, so we've looked into like can we slow down trains? Can we stop elevators? Uh, one of the big things that's kind of weird is like opening fire station doors, which tend to get torqued in an earthquake, and then they spend the first 30 minutes hacking their way out of the fire station. Uh, you know, it sounds stupid, but it's like, if you don't put the doors up, you've got a problem. Uh, and what's great about that particular scenario is the cost of a false positive is annoyance, uh, which is a lot better than things like slowing trains and stopping elevators. You know, the cost of a false positive is a lot higher. Um, just to add to that, so we also talked with Southern California Edison, um, and their response is that if we can give them high reliable, highly reliable uh, warning, they can turn up their transformer in sub-seconds. Um, so that, that's like also a huge say that prevents uh, the, the major uh, clean-up problem of having to make, like, fix up, like, you know, burn down transformer and that stuff. Yeah, what's interesting about the Edison one is because they only need you know, 
sub-second warnings, you can actually perform the detection locally at their power stations. So we're sort of investigating what kinds of reliable detection we can do at power stations without having to involve the whole network. But it's a different kind of problem. The fact that earthquake waves propagate in a regular way makes this sort of reminiscent of track before detect radar. So if you get a few more ticks, slight excess of ticks here, and then uh, a second later you get a slight excess one mile to the east, another second one mile farther to the east, you can pick that up. Do, do you algorithms take that into account? Yeah, I mean, that's effectively how we do the hypocenter detection. So that's stuff that we're working on right when we were leaving. We're just trying to see, you know, we know that we try to fit the picks that we get to a, an estimated model for where we think the hypocenter could be, right? So we're trying to say this propagation in time of picks makes sense with our hypothesis for where the hypocenter should be or it doesn't. And so we're using that to try to figure out how good of detection we can do. In Southern California, it's not very important because detection is accomplished very well by the CISN network. But we want to know if we have a dense enough network of cell phones or USB accelerometer somewhere that doesn't have a seismometer network, how good of a location estimate for the source of the earthquake would you get? And that's the kind of algorithm that we're looking at. Yeah, and, uh, and the thing with this kind of detection algorithm that's different from CISN, what the USGS is doing, is that we're only doing this based on the picks. Um, they're getting a bunch of other information like acceleration and maximum acceleration that helps with their hypocenter detection. But with us, we have a lot more sensor, but it's only based on the arrival, the pick arrival. The pick is basically amplitude or what is it? Oh, sorry, I'm not sure we well defined the pick. The pick is just our name for when uh, a device thinks that there is some kind of event ongoing. So for the USB devices, it's the STAL or LTA algorithm. Whenever that K sigma value travels above the threshold, we generate a pick. And um, we have some rules about like how often we'll transmit a pick, but as long as it remains above that threshold, we'll essentially continuously pick. And for the phones, it's the anomaly detection algorithm, right? So whenever we believe that there's some kind of an anomaly going on, we generate a pick. And because for the various reasons we illustrated, we don't really trust the acceleration of the devices, what we really care about is just whether or not they think there's an event ongoing. And so we use the notion of the devices believing there's an event ongoing to do both location detection and event estimation. Yeah, yeah I was curious about, you did a little work on some historical extrapolation you did, and, and being from Southern California, I'm thinking back to some of these big quakes in the past, like Northridge 94, Ojai 1970, maybe Bakersfield 52. Have you gone back that far to look at some of those real significant quakes in Southern California with the analysis? Uh, yeah, I mean, we have a giant catalog of events. Uh, we've kind of run through just about everything we could find. I mean, we're slightly worried about most of these because all the data we have from back then, it's mostly really sparse, especially as you go back even farther, and it's all really clean because it's from really great sensors. So one of the tricks that Amy talked about that we've done is we take you know, quiescent noise from different types of sensors and we overlay that on the seismometer from historical data and we try to use that to get an idea of like what would a uh, signal look like. But even that's not really an accurate portrayal of how the device would behave in an earthquake. You know, a good example of that is the sea of Allspec data that I showed is that you know, the CISN picked, all of the CISN sensors picked and none of the sensors you know, that we use picked. And that's because they just respond differently, right? So there, there's some value in looking at the historical earthquakes to determine you know, what we think the baselines for our algorithms are, but it's unfortunately not incredibly representative of how they would perform in an actual event. And you know, we have, that's why we're looking for events that we can actually monitor. Right? So that's the sort of eagerness for interesting earthquakes that don't hurt anything. <laughs> What's your expectation about how well the cell, work, cell network will work in the earthquakes? <laughs> Uh, we'll use any network we can find. Uh, you know, um, our one of our consultants on the seismology side <coughs> called this the Indiana Jones problem, the Temple of Doom, you know, sort of collapsing behind you. Uh, you know, because you expect not only the cell network to have issues, but also you know, internet infrastructure, any of these things. Uh, and mostly it just comes down to trying to broadcast on as many different signals as we can. You know, so we explored having both cell and data connections available to the remote deployments that we use. And you know, everywhere we're at, we're doing like you know, power backup and these kinds of things. Uh, 
you know, we don't expect any of these networks to be good, particularly like a minute after an earthquake. But one of the nice things about the cell network is you know, our sensors respond a lot faster than people, so we should be able to get our sensor data out on the cell network before it collapses. But none of this stuff is guaranteed to last very long after the, a bigger event hits. So you mentioned that like the, the anomaly detection algorithm works quite well on the earthquake data. So what's the false rate on the non-earthquake data, like the walking, running, or home activities? Um, so the on the per sensor level, the noise rate is still pretty large. Um, but then the, we actually clean out the, the data when we aggregate a whole bunch of them together. So yeah. if you just observe data from one phone, it's very noisy, it's constantly picking. Um, but if you aggregate like a whole bunch of sensor around it together, and then it's, it's unlikely that everything is moving at exactly the same time. So that's how we get a uh, global level detection to overcome that kind of like sen per sensor level noise. Somebody asked this question in a different way that how much is the battery life affected? <laughs> I want to ask the same question in a different way. How much is the cost of running the system on a per minute basis forever in the hope of detecting one earthquake correctly? And I'm by no means underestimating the cost of earthquake. Do you mean running the infrastructure or? Yes. Um, right now the infrastructure isn't too bad, but you know we're at the more of the sort of 500 level than the tens of thousands level. But you know, to address this problem, one of the things that we've looked at, this addresses both battery life and cost, is you know, how do we selectively turn off sensors to save on infrastructure costs and also to save on battery life? <coughs> you know, so if we can detect that we have a sufficient number of sensors operating in an area, we don't necessarily need them all running all the time. And so using you know, intelligent sampling, we can say, hey, we only need this subset of sensors on at this time. Uh, and we can always do the same thing in terms of receiving signals. You know, we can either ignore them you know, by telling them not to send data for a while, or we can just ignore them. Uh, and that either way can save on infrastructure costs. Right now, the existing network you know, runs less than $100 a month, you know, which is, is nothing. But if we were to multiply that out by a couple orders of magnitude, then the question starts to become, okay, well, who's going to pay for it? And what, you know, what are the ongoing costs and benefits of running this? So when we were first starting using the phone the sensor, and then we had a battery problem. And one of the things that we consider is to trigger the phone sensor in an ad hoc way. So say we tag an earthquake going on either through the fidgets or from the PXM sensors, and then we actually send the message to the phone, say, okay, turn on your sensor and then start giving us data. So we can still record the aftershock data, but not just um, right, right when that big one happens. So that's like something that we explore before. Right.